To protect your sanity, I would encourage you to be prepared with an answer to this question. How profitable is your law firm? And ask yourself this question every day before someone else does. Keep in mind that depending on who is asking, the question, of course, could have a very different meaning. For example, when another lawyer asks, how profitable is your law firm? They often mean compared to their own. While Arjun was away, Team Arjun came to play. All the cats out of the bag now, folks. But we're still here bringing you our favorite and most importantly, actionable insights to Arjun's newest book, Profit First for Lawyers. We're going to help you accelerate your law firm's growth so that you can experience more profit in every aspect of your life. We're also going to be providing some behind-the-scenes footage at what it's really like to work with our John Robbins. So, put your BS aside for the next few minutes and put yourself, your family, your firm, and your profit first. Welcome back to another episode of the Profit First for Lawyers podcast. I'm your host, Carly, and today we are joined in studio with none other than Arjun's own accountant. We've got Daniel here today. Daniel, welcome to the show. Oh, hello. Thank you so much. Great to be here. I'm so glad. Daniel was initially a little bit hesitant when I asked him to be on this show, uh, but when I explained how much he knows in the grand scheme of things and how much we really want him here, he finally relented to my pleas and said that he would come on. So I really am very, very glad that you decided at last, Daniel, to join me here. I think we're going to have a lot of fun today. Begrudgingly, but but uh, I, I looked, looked through some of the other podcasts and you seem like a great host, so I said I had to. Oh, thank you. God, I wasn't even fishing for compliments, but I'm going to take it. <laughs> All right, Daniel. Well, let's start it out here then. For those who don't know you, go ahead and introduce yourself. What do you do? Um, what do you work on? And how do you know Arjun? Uh, yeah. So my name is Daniel Farrow. I'm a CPA. Uh, I actually got my CPA at HTM. I passed. Oh. HTM gave me the time to take all four tests I needed. And actually helped me through it, set aside the time. And so I passed all four exams, got my CPA license, and now I am both the senior accounting manager and I do Arjun's personal financial books. Wow, I did not know that. <laughs> uh, you know, I had kind of a similar question for Larry Brown. We spoke with um, tax strategist Larry Brown, uh, you know, because he mentioned that Arjun told him to go after the industries that she, he was really interested in. And I said, but taxes, Larry Brown? Uh, and I kind of feel like I'm, I'm having the same energy with you right now, Daniel. CPA, that was your dream? Tell me more about that. It was my mom's dream mostly, but, and I fell into it. I played a lot of sports and I was in like musical theater and middle school and stuff. So most times when people meet me, they think I'm, I'm too fun <laughs> to be an accountant. I guess that's kind of what to say it. Um, but the numbers just make sense. And and when you get to know them, they actually are, uh, there's a lot of beauty in it, a lot of interesting things and, and insights you can get. So I've learned, I've learned to love the job. It didn't come initially. It, it took some time, but I got there. <laughs> that is so interesting. I, I've never really thought about beauty in numbers. All right, Daniel. So you mentioned that you had been working for HTM and for Arjun a while before you became his own accountant, right? His own CPA. Um, when did you, what did you come in as? How long have you been with the company? What started that initial journey? Uh, yeah. So I've been in accounting for four or five years, but mostly lower level stuff. And I came in as just the staff accountant. I was actually like third in the rung with the company, but as it is with HTM, it's, it's the next man up. And uh, I slowly was able to keep proving myself and growing with HTM. And got to the point where I became the senior manager. So I'm running basically all the operations for the financial team for enterprise. And Arjun had a bookkeeper who sucked. And so <laughs> we don't like bookkeepers that sucks. As we know with bookkeeping, that doesn't suck. So they, he was thinking about who he could find. He was looking externally. And then with a conversation with Oscar, our CEO, he said, well, wouldn't Daniel be a good fit since he knows everything about you, since everything that the company touches kind of touches you. So Arjun and I had a meeting, set some expectations, and it's been about two years now that I've been his personal uh, bookkeeper. It's much more challenging than you would imagine. Oh, I imagine it's challenging. It keeps it fun, for sure. <laughs> 
Yeah, definitely life around here is never boring. So let me ask you, Daniel, before you came on at HDM, did you have any preconceived notions about what life was going to look like here? Did you do any research on Arjun beforehand to know kind of what that was going to be like? I was thrown into this really blind. Um, I went to a talent agency kind of thing and they're like, hey, I went to meet with them. And while I was leaving the parking lot, they said, so we have this place. It's called how to manage a small law firm.com. They're like, and I was like, what does that even mean? And they're like, you go right now on the way home. I'm like, I'm in jeans. I wasn't even dressed to go to an interview, but they sent me to the interview and I met with Sherry Mansell, the CFO. I met with Oscar, the CEO. Uh, we did the whole message to Garcia, uh, reading mm -hmm. that short story and going through that uh, process. And they kind of warned me. They're like, look, this is a very entrepreneurial fast paced. It, it's, you will never do the same thing twice. And, uh, what was interesting is I had another job for the exact same position, making the exact same amount of money doing the same thing I was doing before. Very boring. And I remember I went home that night and I asked my family, I'm like, what do you guys think I should do? I can both same amount of money. I can go do the same thing and be in the same place for 30 years, a boring credit union, or I can take this crazy challenge and see where it takes me. And I, I kind of feel like that was a first step in making like an entrepreneurial decision. Cause once I did that, it's just, just keep steamrolling into this <laughs> crazy decisions <laughs> head on. Yeah. You know, we had um, Oscar on the show not too long ago and um, he had talked about, you know, Arjun comes up with things that you would never imagine in your wildest dreams. And I had told him, you know, my dreams became wilder after meeting Arjun, right? What I thought was my wildest dreams, they became even wilder. <laughs> it feels like that way because I always limited myself to, I, I almost didn't even think I would get my CPA. I, I was, I didn't really see the benefit since I wasn't going to be an auditor or anything. Um, but yeah, he just keeps bringing up opportunities and things you don't even know or expect that, that you would think you would be willing to do. Um, it's just something about this place, HGM, that brings that out in you. You know, Daniel, you mentioned something that I'm trying to think now. I don't think that we've had anybody else mention on the show. And it's it's pretty odd because this is one of Arjun's favorite things. You mentioned the message to Garcia. Um, and this is a really big part of, I know it was my onboarding, everybody's onboarding. This is something that Arjun will shed tears about every time he reads it. Um, I can't believe we've never mentioned it before. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's a fantastic it's only like three four pages long it's a pretty short story they literally had me read it they stepped out of the room during the interview had me read it and came back in and then we talked it through and the first thing oscar says is like okay what'd, what'd you get out of this and uh it was it was odd you know i'd never experienced that in an interview but after it totally makes sense because the story is all about uh, accountability and the type of people that we like working with at htm and it's very indicative of what Arjun expects from, from his team. He expects everyone to be your own kind of entrepreneur within the business. And he's not going to hold your hand, but he's going to give you all the rain in the world to, to, to build and grow and make things within the business itself. And it's, uh, it's really free. It's, it's a very liberating kind of concept when you're trusted. If you're here, we trust you to, to put out a good product and, and, do it the way that you see best. And that's the kind of people that, that are part of our John's team. Yeah. That's been one of my favorite things about working here so far is that level of trust. And even though it comes with a lot of responsibility, right? Where they will literally, I mean, <laughs> the producer of this podcast and I, we joke all the time because when Delisi, our uh, chief of staff had originally said, we're going to create a podcast. Um, we didn't really get a ton of instructions. It was just like, all right, you're going to do a podcast and it's going to be this time and get it done. Here's the deadline, right? Have it done tomorrow. <laughs> well, we'll figure it out. Yeah. But those are the people that, and then those are the people that stick around are the ones who can, who can take just the, the, the base goal and the vision and, and push for it. And that's, those are the only people that stick around. Um, <laughs> if you can't keep up with that, it, it's, you're not going to make it on this team. And, uh, it means that the people who do stick around, you know, you can trust anybody that's here. So 
obviously you work a lot one-on-one with Arjun. You have to. Um, Mm -hmm. What is it actually like to work in such close proximity with somebody like Arjun Robbins? It takes a while to get used to it a little bit because he's, he's very passionate and he takes every word that you say at face value. He, he, if you say something, he will believe you. I remember in one of the first budget meetings I had, like my first year, which I was like six months in or something, I was at a budget meeting and he was talking about different ways to to motivate the team. And uh, he came up with the idea of like, wouldn't it be cool to like put a picture of something there, not cash, but like a thing that you really want, whether it's, I don't know, maybe it's a set of golf clubs or a vacation or something. And I just said, oh yeah, man, I would love a Tesla. And like four years later, he still brings it up and says, hey, did you ever get that Tesla? Uh, and what's funny is two months ago, my fiance just bought a Tesla. So finally got it in the family. Uh, but Arjun takes everything super serious. Very, um, he trusts you. He, 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 he treats you as, as an adult and, and expects that what you're saying is what you mean. So uh, he, he doesn't like BS a lot. He likes yeah. to be- <laughs> It's, it's not not so much just random banter. A lot of it is is very to the T. You always find yourself in a meeting with him thinking, man, this is crazy. Like, what is he talking about? And then six months later, yep, that worked. Good job, Arjun. You were right. <laughs> that seems to be the theme for a lot of uh, our meetings. You know, I see that pattern already. And I'm just now approaching my one year work anniversary with the company. Um, that's so funny. And I, I loved what you said too about the Tesla because I don't know if you know or if you had seen this episode yet, but I told Arjun once that I really, really, really wanted a fancy bidet. And that was my first bonus. <laughs> <laughs> for meeting a marketing goal. He literally, he had a he had a company that came in and installed a really fancy, like the, the fanciest of smart bidet toilets. It's got a plug and wow. everything. Like it is, this wow. thing has so many features. It is fully loaded. Um, wow. And it's in my bathroom right now. Uh, and I love where you framed that as, you know, he trusts you that, that you are going to be an adult and that you're going to tell him the truth. Um, mm-hmm. And he's going to take you at face value. And not only that, but I think it's really, really telling that he remembered after four years that what you said was the Tesla. Mm-hmm. Um, because there are a lot of people that I have worked for, right, that that ask the question and don't really care or they don't retain the answer. And that has not at all been my experience with Arjun. <laughs> if he asks you a question, it's because he genuinely cares about what's going on. Here, here. Well, let me ask you then, Daniel, one of my favorite questions that I've been asking is what is the most profitable piece of advice that Arjan has either given to you directly or has given somebody else that you've taken in and put into your life that's improved your life? It's That was so hard. There's so many. There's so many. Five years. <laughs> the the quibits that come out of your mouth. He's like, ah, oh, that's really good. There's, I mean, there's the bullshit one, like having to be able to tell what bullshit is. That one's great. I think one of the ones that sticks with me is uh, the idea of, of a profitable transaction. I always used to feel like, oh, there's a winner and there's a loser. Because like, oh, if I sold you this car and I made $2,000 off of you, haha, I won. You just got mm-hmm. a car. But that's not the true concept of profit. He was able to explain, and I'll try my best. Uh, but, but essentially, he would say that if any transaction that's happened between two people that are both being honest, is profitable for both people. Now, yes, you made an extra $2,000 on that car, but that $2,000 was worth it for me for that car because I needed it. And whether it's that or whether it's trading a stick of bubble gum for a high five or uh, (laughs) whatever the case is, that every single transaction that's ever happened in human history has been profitable for both sides because you, that other person found profit in that. And, And I, to me, that really helps with like sales. Cause as an accountant, I can't imagine selling myself and I have to, cause I have to sell myself to the executive teams or, or sell kind of the, the budget or the forecast for the year. And I always struggle feeling like they don't want to be a part of it or, or I'm because I'm going to might get something out of this. Maybe I'm going to get a bonus or something that I don't, it doesn't feel like it's fair. But that concept of no, if I'm giving them this a value and they're taking it, 
then this is a perfectly profitable exchange and it's best for both of us. So that was that that really helped me frame the idea of like selling and and, and having those kinds of conversations. Yeah, I I really have enjoyed Arjun's definition of profit too, right? Um, we had a healthy debate about this <laughs> um, back in February when I was very, very, very new to the team, uh, where I was trying to think of an example of an exchange that wasn't profitable, you know, oh. where he really drilled in. And he told me, like, look, as long as there's no fraud involved, as long as nobody's being dishonest, if if both people are coming to the table with the truth, then it is a profitable exchange, yep. period. And I, man, I was throwing out all kinds of uh, <laughs> examples at him. And example, he, metaphor, analogy you could come up with. And yeah, he, I was like, what about this one? <laughs> and eventually I had to seed defeat. I was like, oh, all right, you're right. You're right. I was, yeah, you're, you're right. That's fair. <laughs> Well, that does tie in a little bit with the clip that you brought today, right? Do you want to go ahead and yeah. introduce this before we play it? Sure. Yeah. So um, this clip had to do with profitability. And I think it's interesting because it's not just that the transaction is profitable. It's it's how your audience or who you're you're talking to about this would consider it to be profitable. And and different people would get a completely different idea of of, of the value of that profitability. Okay. I'm excited to see it. Let's roll the clip. To protect your sanity, I would encourage you to be prepared with an answer to this question. How profitable is your law firm? And ask yourself this question every day before someone else does. Keep in mind that depending on who is asking, the question, of course, could have a very different meaning. For example, when another lawyer asks, how profitable is your law firm? They often mean compared to their own. Or they could mean should I buy it? Or they may be feeling you out to find out if you might consider coming to work for them. When a prospective lender is asking how profitable is your law firm, they probably want to know if you will be a good customer who will borrow lots of money from them and pay it back on time. And when your spouse or significant other asks how profitable is this law firm, they are probably looking for some reassurances that all of the sacrifices you and your family have made will be worth it. But the most important opinion about the profitability of your law firm that you must be concerned with, of course, is your own. And here is where it gets a little bit tricky because as the owner of the business, we must, at least we should, take into consideration more than what is conventionally understood to be profit. As entrepreneurs who built our firms from nothing and who wake up every day and do it again, we must ask ourselves a deeper question. Compared to what? For example, let's say you and I had the opportunity to invest in two different law firms, Firm A and Firm B. Firm A, this law firm will give you about $1 million of personal income. This law firm will require you to work 70 hours a week doing work that you hate for clients who you will despise. And you never get to take a vacation or else the minute you step away, the wheels are going to fall off because there are no documented policies, procedures, or operating systems that empower the staff to keep the machine running while you are away. But you will personally earn $1 million a year. Now let's take a look at Firm B. Firm B will give you only $500,000 of personal income per year. This law firm requires you to work an average of about 50 hours a week, doing work you find meaningful for clients who you care about. Firm B has been equipped with good enough operating systems and staff to allow you to take time off for all of the federal holidays, plus you can take a real vacation for 30 consecutive days each year with emergency access only, and a high degree of confidence that while you are away, each of the seven main parts of the law firm will keep going and even growing in your absence. This way, you can actually enjoy your vacation with the confidence that when you get back, you won't find a smoldering pile of you-know-what waiting for you. But 
you will personally earn only half as much from firm B as compared to what you would personally earn from firm A. Which of the two law firms do you think your banker, your CPA, or your bookkeeper would tell you is more profitable? Which do you think your spouse or significant other would say is more profitable? Which law firm do you imagine most of the lawyers who you hang around with would consider to be the more profitable law firm? Most importantly, which law firm would contribute the most to your overall happiness as a human being? Admittedly, these are extreme examples, but which of these two firms would you prefer to invest your time, energy, and attention to grow? Ooh, that's a good one, Daniel. It, it's a question that a lot of small business owners get tied up in. My family itself, my my brother has a small construction business and he struggles with the idea of, okay, do I keep it small and just really profitable, small, tiny team, or do I start trying to go for these bigger, bigger buildings and businesses, which have higher revenue numbers and a lot more work and the possibility of more profits, but a whole lot more stress. And uh, it's funny, he he's actually bounced between the two like year over year for the last two, three years while we try to figure out which is the right, most profitable business for him. Yeah, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because it really does depend who is asking you. Um, I feel like obviously I do not own a business, um, but that's a, a very interesting question to kind of, I don't know, take stock of in yourself too and say, okay, I think the question is, is this serving my goals? Is this serving me personally, professionally, and financially? It's almost like a, you're guiding light when you're making these other decisions. Okay, how does it fall into that little trifecta of, of goals I have? How has your mindset as an accountant, how has it shifted from where you thought of profit before coming on to HTM and now today working really closely with Arjun on his personal finances? I mean, I know that this mindset is not necessarily one that that tends to be super linear um, mm-hmm. with the things that financial advisors are, are kind of told naturally, unless you had a really good teacher. <laughs> Yeah, no, we're not taught to to think outside the lines. We're taught to, these are the specific rules. There's very little flex. Stay within them. Arjun hates them. And that's why. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, well, both. He, he, he sees the value and he understands, like, I've never met a CEO who knows so much about financials than he does. He challenges me regularly. And um, he knows his stuff, which is critical because it allows us to get deeper conversations about all this stuff. But uh, between the profit first books and everything, it, it, it just changes your mindset on leaving that for last, which is the standard ideas. Hey, profits, just what's left over and you get to take it as where I know profit first. And a lot of the other ideas is no, we have to put that as one of the first priorities and then we'll figure everything else out. And our John lives and breathes that, to this core in, in, in most decisions that he makes. It's how do we get the profit out of this? Is this profitable? And then we'll figure out the rest. And in, as an accountant, that's not the way I'm trained to think, but it helps me because I, I think I'm ever to, because I'm thinking about the profit, I can, I can give a better explanation of the financials and things with that mindset. It's like, okay, the business owner doesn't really care about the pluses and minuses. So like, how does this profitably affect them like how does the actual profit come to them and 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 not just pure dollars but in hey this expenditure that i just made that the fact that i grew my team by a thousand dollars or whatever that means that i have to spend less time doing that thing so that is profitable to me that thousand bucks that just bought me back 10 hours of my life so (laughs) having those kind of conversations instead of just saying oh my god your your expenses went up by a thousand dollars That's not beneficial. It's having that deeper conversation. So Arjun, I mean, he pounds that into our heads and and it it works. And it it is the deeper truth in the numbers kind of thing. It kind of sounds like the result of 
switching that mindset right from your um, traditional accounting brain to your profit first accounting brain, really what it, it sounds like to me is that it's really made you an advocate for your clients, right? Like you're, you are looking at the data in a different way um, with that focus, right? With that flashlight, this is the customer's, the client's goal. Um, mm-hmm. And so these are the things that we need to do in order to make that happen. Um, it kind of, it sounds like it's more of a, of a team thing than a reporting thing, right? Like he's enlisted you in the service. <laughs> Yeah, it's just so easy to to get caught up in the numbers and say this is up ten percent, this is nine percent. There was a comedian that I heard somewhere that he's like accountants. He's like they can point at a problem and they can tell you what's wrong, but they can't tell you how to fix it. They just they just point at the problem and say this is bad. You gotta <laughs> that's wrong. And uh, so by looking at things as, as far as how they can bring profit to the business to the business owner. Uh, it helps change that narrative and 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 better answer those questions to to actually help them instead of just pointing at things. What are some things that our listeners can do today to help set themselves and their bookkeepers or their accountants up for success as we get closer to the new year? One thing you could ask your bookkeeper to do, they, they probably won't be able, well, this is how you know they're a good bookkeeper. If you can tell them to, hey, I want you to gross up my earnings. So when you get paid, it's the net amount, right? It's less your taxes, it's less your 401k and your state taxes mm-hmm. and things like that. But that doesn't give you a great picture of, of, of how much you're making. So if you get your W-2s to your accountant or your bookkeeper, they can, using the information there, gross it up so you see, hey, if I make $100,000 in a year, I want my revenue to say $100,000. And then you would it would have the expenses everywhere else. And, and it gives you a better, truer picture of, of your real wealth and your income and what you're doing. That's one that Arjun had me put together. Uh, for him, it's a little bit more complicated because he's got a lot of income from from a lot of places. <laughs> so I, uh, yeah, probably only a CPA could do it. But for sure, most other people where it's just a W-2, one distribution from a business, that should totally be doable. <laughs> uh, everything, you don't sweat the small stuff. Like, if you have Amazon, don't worry about going crazy. Just create an expense sign that says Amazon. Don't don't try to split out pillows from coffee. Just make it simple. Focus on the things that matter. Focus on the things that matter. I think that might even be the tagline. We we've talked a lot in this episode about really focusing on your goals. Um, and it sounds like that's what you're saying as far as as far as your financials go as well, right? Just have a better focus. Figure out what you're looking for. Don't don't miss the forest for all of the trees. Absolutely, it's 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 so easy to do that. And um, in, in your personal financials too, you you start freaking out about oh, I'm spending too much on Starbucks or something. When it's probably not that. It's probably something much more obvious, much more glaring. Maybe it's that you bought a car that you can't afford, or uh, some other major financial decision that that. Don't sit there and dwell on the little things like group all that into something, some little area that says miscellaneous or whatever. And uh, like you said, focus on, on the things that matter. Yeah. Ooh, speaking to your point of, you know, with every valid and honest exchange, you make a profit. Is there a better profit that I could be making by, you know, giving up something that I really enjoy so that I can work towards something that I enjoy even more. Well said. <laughs> that was a peak. That was that. That feels like the two years of my life I spent taking my CPA exams. It was. <laughs> I'm. I. I know. I'm. I'm making a conscious decision. I know this is profitable, even though I hate doing it. I know this is the most profitable thing I could be doing. Um, and luckily, HTM was there and Arjun to just keep pushing to make sure every, I think every time I'd see Arjun he'd come over and be like hey you CPA yet like, <laughs> two tests down I got two more two more two more so he held me accountable <laughs> that's amazing Daniel can I ask and you don't have to answer this at all but for your own home finances now that you have your background um you know you've got all this training as a CPA what do you do differently now than you did before that has 
kind of gotten you closer to some of your goals? Basically, what we can what can we hack into some of this knowledge to start doing things differently in our personal lives uh, to hopefully get some more profit? I've used kind of the profit first method of the minute cash comes in my account, I know I have certain expenses and things and I allocate them here and there and there. And that's the biggest thing for me is making sure that all of my major savings and all of my major expenses are right away set aside, do not touch. And whatever little cash I have left over, that is the fun cash. That has been the best way to help me keep kind of tracks because if I just start trying to spend the money first, it's it's gone. So sticking to the profit first idea of put your money away, put your savings, put your five, 10%, whatever it is, uh, I, I live that to this day. That one thing had, keeps me through and, and keeps everything flowing really well. I had never considered using Profit First for my personal finances. Oh, that is crucial. Um, you have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, but instead of profits, it would be uh, savings or a trip fund or something along those lines where the first thing you do is the most important thing to you. So if your, your first most important thing is, mm -hmm. I need want to go on this trip to Europe, that's where you put your 5% your first 5% that you get from your, the cash that comes into your house goes into that account. And then the rest, you make it work. The rest, you figure out your expenses after that. I'm going to repeat this because I thought that this was profound and you said it really quickly. The first thing you do is the most important thing to you. Right? I read a quote once. I can't remember where. Um, I think it was in like a, a home magazine. Um, and they said, Instead of saying, I don't have time, start saying, it's not a priority to me, right? Um, like, I don't have time to go to the doctor. Then it becomes, my health is not a priority for me. But I thought what you said was really important because that is such a crucial way to, I think, make headway on your goals, right? Is to figure out what is my biggest priority? What am I saying is my biggest priority? And now let me allocate some time funds or actual funds, right? To make sure that that actually happens. Absolutely. And then thank you for taking that from just the financial point to the full life and how time, because it's, yeah, it, it's one of those concepts that starts with money, but can work its way into just mindset and all other aspects. Oh, that was great, Daniel. It starts with money and ends with mindset. Thank you so much, Daniel. I I really have enjoyed this conversation today. Thanks for letting me bully you into coming on. Uh, you, you totally did, but it, it's been fun. So I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm so glad. All right, folks, that's what we've got for you today. I hope that you have found this episode really interesting. And as we promise, that it has been filled with some actionable insights to help you get more profit out of everyday life. All right, stay tuned next time as we go over some more actionable insights and we will see you there. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Profit First for Lawyers. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, tell a friend and buy your copy of the book at ProfitFirstForLawyers.com your future self will thank you for it. And we will see you next time.